Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation. FFF's mission is to present an uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And as part of that mission, we have always taken a firm opposition to the government's war on drugs. And so we were establishing a video series featuring people in the libertarian movement and outside the libertarian movement explaining why they are opposed to this war and why they are devoting a large portion of their life's energies to getting this war repealed. And so I'm honored to have as my guest today to share his perspectives on this government program, Ted Galen Carpenter. Ted is the Senior Fellow for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, one of the premier libertarian uh, think tanks in the country. And Ted, you've been there a long time, haven't you? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, I have. Um, and it's interesting because the very first public debate I had when I came to the Cato Institute in 1986 was with Jack Lawn, who was the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration at that time. So the very first issue I had to deal with was with the, uh, with the drug war. And uh, I've been dealing with that issue ever since, and fortunately seeing a major shift in public opinion. That has been one of the more gratifying aspects of my career. Yeah, it really goes to show the power of ideas, uh, and especially ideas on liberty. That You'll recall that Friedman wrote the, the essay in Newsweek in 1972 calling for an end of the drug war, and then he followed up with that open letter to Bill Bennett. Uh, in 1990 in the Wall Street Journal. And those were lonely days for those of us calling for an end to the war on drugs. And uh, things really have taken a shift, haven't they? They certainly have. Uh, the debate that I had with uh, Jack Long, I would say the audience that uh, day was 90% hostile <laughs> to our point of view, at least 90%. And if Long had not tried to make the case that alcohol prohibition had been a great success, I think that uh, the audience might have even been more favorable to his point of view. That was a bridge too far for a lot of people that day. But uh, certainly audiences today are much more receptive to the argument that the drug for war has failed that it has been a disaster, that it has caused so many problems for our society, and that they are willing to look at alternatives, including legalization. So it's a very different environment from what it was three decades ago. Yeah, I've never seen so many op-eds and editorials and perspectives from just mainstream people saying, this this war is over. It's time to end it, and it's time to legalize drugs. But let's talk about some of these horrors that you're referring to. You say that the drug war has been a disaster. Well, in what respect? It's been a disaster both domestically and internationally. Uh, I think it has been one of the most disruptive elements in the communities in the United States, uh, particularly in, uh, in non-white communities. Uh, it has been a major reason for high incarceration rates in African-American and Hispanic communities, uh, destroying lives often before they even get started. I mean, what a great way to begin your life as an adult to have a, a rap sheet that you have been convicted of a, of a uh, criminal offense. And yet for a lot of African-American males in particular, or Hispanic males, that is the way they start out. And internationally, we have caused immense tragedy. We have enriched the coffers of violent drug cartels throughout Latin America and elsewhere. And those cartels have turned their weapons on a lot of innocent people. They have corrupted governments throughout uh, the hemisphere and beyond. And uh, they have created monumental social problems. So 
our drug war has been a calamity, a social calamity for our people and people in other countries. Yeah, it has certainly fallen on everybody in society that probably is hardly a family that hasn't been impacted in one way or the other with somebody being sent away to jail or having a criminal record for being a drug addict or, or distributing drugs, some peaceful transaction. Uh, but it certainly, as you point out, has fallen disproportionately on blacks, on Hispanics. But what do you say to the argument that, look, these people have chosen to do this. They've chosen to engage in the drug trade, uh, distributing drugs or consuming drugs. They, they didn't have to do these things. And so what's wrong with locking them up for that? Well, I always go back to the first principle of uh, self-ownership, that your body is your body. And I... I I particularly use that argument with conservatives who are always talking about property rights. What is the most basic property right of all but the ownership of your own body? And if you don't have that right, how can you talk about the right to own external property? I used to have that argument back when I was in high school and college with conservative friends who would go on and on about the right to own property, but somehow never seemed to get it, that that, by definition, ought to apply to your right to own your own body. Now, that doesn't mean you, you will necessarily make wise decisions about the use of your body. Hopefully you will, but that doesn't necessarily follow. But you ought to have the right, the autonomy, to make that decision in a free society. And if you are able to make that decision, then you're at least responsible for the consequences. If you've managed to make a mess of your life because of decisions you've made, that's bad enough. But it's much, much worse if your life has been made a mess because of decisions that other people have imposed upon you. And that's the situation we have with the drug war. It, it really does boggle my mind that somebody can sit in the privacy of his own home and decide to engage in self-destructive behavior, and that somehow or another that triggers the government to have the authority to come bashing down your door and saying, you're doing bad things to yourself, and so we're going to seize you, prosecute you, convict you, and put you in a jail cell for the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, we all would agree as libertarians, Ted, that if you go out and engage in violence against another person, you kill another person, that you certainly can't use the fact that you were drugged out as a defense any more than if you were drunk uh, and you did the same thing. Certainly. Now, compare... You, you brought up prohibition earlier. Give me the argument on prohibition in the 1930s with alcohol as compared to prohibition of drugs. Well, the argument of people like Jack Lawn, and there are other defenders of prohibition. They insist prohibition was a success, that it reduced uh, the overall rate of alcohol consumption that it reduced the rate of alcoholism. And there are some statistics to back up those contentions. But what I've argued that even if you grant those arguments, that's like looking at a corporate balance sheet and only looking at the income and asset side and ignoring the outflow and liabilities. Well, if you do that, then Entities such as Enron, WorldCom, and, and Lehman Brothers were wonderfully run entities. It's the liabilities that were the major problem. And prohibition, just as the drug war now, enriched, empowered, violent, criminal syndicates. They ran roughshod in American cities, 
violence soared, you had blood in the streets, you had gang wars, and that was a major cost of prohibition. So was corruption. Corruption of government entities soared during prohibition as there was more corrupt money to be had. And we're seeing again the same problem here and abroad with regard to the drug war. Now, that's a fascinating point that the drug warriors just don't seem to get, that they, they you know, go after these drug dealers, these drug gangs, the cartels. They have record drug busts, and they celebrate the fact that they're locking up another drug dealer for the next 30 years. But he's always replaced by a new gang or a new new drug dealer. I mean, the war really is a forever thing. And they don't get that it's their war itself that gives rise to to the drug gangs, to these unsavory elements that don't exist in a legitimate legalized market. So would you talk a little bit about a black market, the prices, the, the, the profits that, that go into this thing that induces people to go into the drug war, the drug business? That's the key point. When you have high demand for a product or service, the only thing that can be determined by laws is whether that product or service will be provided in a legal manner or in a black market. You're not going to stamp out that demand. Now, with the drug war, our brilliant <coughs> political class has determined that that supply will be handled through the black market. And what that means is that criminal elements will dominate the supply chain. That drives up the price because there is a risk factor involved. And it ensures that the most corrupt, violence-prone elements in society will dominate that trade instead of legitimate business people. How this is a preferable solution, how that reasoning comes into play, eludes me. I don't understand how our legislators think that is a preferable method. But apparently, they concluded that that, that is a preferable method. Yeah, well, and it's what not, we've seen, okay. what we've seen is that uh, the illegality, the black market premium, drives up the price of drugs very substantially. Most estimates indicate that. Currently, illicit drugs would be selling for about one-tenth of the street value that they now sell for, if you had a legal market. Yeah, well, explain to people what would happen to these drug gangs and cartels with drug legalization and why that would be. You would see the drug gangs and cartels do one of two things. Either they would have to morph into more legitimate enterprises, or they'd be marginalized and go out of business and be displaced by honest enterprises. You yeah, that, probably have a bit of both happening in a dynamic situation. Um, it's not easy for uh, criminal enterprises to uh, transform into honest businesses, but we did have some uh, bootlegging enterprises during Prohibition that apparently made the transition. I'm not going to name names, but uh, some that uh, apparently uh, made that transition. But it is not easy. I think what you would find is a gradual displacement of the criminal elements with fully honest business enterprises, and that would be to everyone's benefit. We're already seeing that on a small scale with the legalization of marijuana in uh, places like Colorado. People are not getting their marijuana from the Mexican cartels anymore. Why should they when they can buy that product from local fully legitimate growers in Colorado? So the Mexican cartels have found 
that aspect of their uh, their sales declining dramatically. And I think you would see that same thing on a much larger scale if you had national legalization of marijuana, and you'd see this a similar process if you had legalization of other drugs on a national level. Yeah, because as you pointed out during Prohibition, that's exactly what happened. All those... Uh all those gang wars and the shootouts and the violence, it really just went away once Prohibition was ended. Uh, tell me a little bit about the collateral violence associated with the drug war uh, in terms of robberies and muggings and that sort of thing. You, you make a terrific point about the, the transition. I mean, you know, today uh, – the beer industry is in the hands of Anheuser-Busch and uh, Coors and so on. During Prohibition, it was in the hands of Al Capone and Dutch Schultz. I would ask the drug warriors, which is the better model? And if you apply that to marijuana, which would you rather have in charge of the marijuana trade? The Mexican cartels, the Sinaloa cartel, Blue Federation, and so on? Or would you rather have honest businesses in charge of it? Because that's the real alternative. And the collateral damage is is enormous. Uh, you Again, as you did during alcohol prohibition, you have shootouts on the streets. You have innocent victims being targeted. Um, the, the damage to society is quite substantial. We're seeing this in... Um, cities, particularly south of the border in Mexico and Central America, uh, societal agony in many cases with uh, corruption uh, of the political system on a, on a massive scale and uh, a level of violence where there are entire neighborhoods, entire cities in some cases, where it is not really safe for honest people to venture out. And that is a tremendous tragedy. And to think U.S. policy has caused that sort of thing to happen is not exactly a source of national pride. Yeah, you've really played a leading role in, in raising people's awareness of what the drug war has done to Latin America and, and other parts of the world, but predominantly in Latin America, since it's so close. I mean, as bad as the drug war has been here in the United States, it really is a thousand times worse in, in Latin America. And you, you've written this fantastic book called The Fire Next Door about what the drug war has done to Mexico. And I have firsthand experience with this. That I grew up on the border in Laredo, Texas. When I was growing up, the drug war was just starting to get ramped up, but it really wasn't the uh, to where it was is today. And we would go across the river as high school students on dates. Everybody you know, would have a good time. It was peaceful. It was safe. Uh, nobody ever raised any questions about how dangerous it is to go into Mexico. Americans would come down. College students would come down. No, none of that exists anymore. I mean, nobody dares in Laredo to go across the border and just in search of dinner or a good time because it's so dangerous. And so talk a little bit about what the drug war has done to, to Latin America. It's the worst, actually, in Central America, even more than Mexico. You have entire areas of some Central American countries uh, Honduras and Guatemala in particular, where you have the drug cartels effectively controlling major chunks of territory, where the governmental authorities really do not uh, uh, have much control at all. And in Mexico itself, you're correct, there, especially the border cities, there are areas uh, that have become extraordinarily dangerous, where the cartels... Uh, are either dominant or they're at war with one another, which in some ways is even worse. And uh, it's extremely risky to venture, even in broad daylight, to say nothing at night. Uh, that has been a change that has uh, taken place, has grown 
exponentially worse over the past decade, when uh, particularly uh, when Mexican President Felipe Calderon, at the request of the U.S. government, escalated the war on drugs in Mexico. He decided to bring in the army in a frontal assault against the drug cartel, really make it a war on drugs. That proved to be an utterly disastrous strategy. And the level of violence spiked dramatically. His successor has tried to draw that back somewhat. Um, but the, the uh, level of violence has subsided only slightly. And you have some major turf fights taking place. So the situation is very, very worrisome. Mexico is not on the brink of being a failed state. It's not that dire. But we, when I say we, I mean the U.S. government, have contributed to destabilizing our southern neighbor and causing enormous problems for the people of our country. And to do so in the name of this misbegotten crusade is especially tragic. Yeah, it really is. And it seems that the more they crack down like they did in Mexico, the worse the situation becomes for the average person. You know, there's there's people caught in the crossfire. Uh, there's also the corruption aspect. Would you talk a little bit about that, where, you know, police departments, uh, especially in Latin America, and entire sectors of the government have become part of the drug business simply because they, they sometimes don't have a real choice. It's either you help us or you die. And so you've had this massive corruption, haven't you, in, throughout Latin America? Cartels often give... Uh police officials, and uh, sometimes politicians. A choice, silver or lead, take a bribe or take a bullet. And often, recently, especially the last few years, it's not just you have the choice of silver or lead, but it's your family. You either take a bribe or your family will be killed. Well, given that choice, not surprisingly, a lot of people decide to take a bribe, especially when the bribes are often very lucrative. Yeah. Many times the bribe will be equal to or exceeding a year's salary or several years' salary of what they can earn in their official job. Well, it takes a rather special person to resist that kind of temptation, especially when the alternative is to risk death. Uh, so it has been very, very easy for the cartels to penetrate the political establishment, the judicial <laughs> establishment, and the, uh, the police. And what you find is that the, the uh, drug cartels often have their tentacles in all of those institutions. So the corruption runs very, very deep in Mexico, in the Central American country. Yeah, and they do the same thing with the press, where they, they tell the press, you don't report on what's happening here, or we'll come after you. I mean, it just it corrupts all the way across the board, and, and your point about people acting very rationally is is – is well put, and the same thing applies to Americans who get involved in the drug trade, like regular people that would never do it ordinarily, like airline attendants and so forth that are smuggling a package of cocaine or something. I mean, there's a rationality to it in the sense that these are enormous profits that can be made with just one score, and somebody that's in financial difficulty, is uh, it's, 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 it's easy to understand why they would be tempted to take the chance, because in all likelihood, most people don't get caught. Those that do pay a, an enormous price. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there there is a risk factor, but you're correct. Uh, the odds are the person who takes that risk is not going to get caught. Uh, with regard to uh, 
the cartels and the press. It's, it's interesting because the old strategy for the cartels was to just intimidate the press. Now it's a bit more sophisticated. Uh, the Sinaloa cartel in particular, but the, some of the others apparently now actually have press officers to try to manipulate the message. And they are actually issuing some press releases to make sure their message gets out the way they want it to be heard and seen by the people. And that represents a new level of sophistication that suggests that uh, they are going beyond just pure profit maximization. They are beginning to challenge the existing political <clears throat> establishment for political legitimacy. It's almost a, uh, a parallel government that is beginning to take place in certain regions of Mexico and in some of the Central American countries. Yeah, well, as you pointed out, this is a failed government program. Uh, tell us a little bit about the militarization of the drug war. That, as, as you know, it's illegal for the military to involve itself in criminal matters here in the United States. Uh, the American people have said as a matter of policy, this is not a good thing to be have the military involved in criminal justice matters. And yet there's some hypocrisy going on because the U.S. military does get involved in the drug war in Latin America. And talk a little bit about that and, and what the, uh, the effects have been. Well, uh, what we find is that the U.S. military is assisting the police forces and the militaries of a number of Latin American countries. And we have seen, for example, in Honduras, of uh, the U.S. military actively involved in raids against suspected drug cartels. So this is at least a low-intensity conflict involving the drug war. Now, that hasn't spread that far yet uh, with regard to Central America, but you've had U.S. military involved in uh, identifying and assisting Latin American governments shooting down suspected drug planes. That has been going on for oh, 20 years, <clears throat> planes coming out of the, uh, the Andean countries uh, carrying suspected cocaine shipments, for instance. So uh, the U.S. military has been involved in a fairly uh, extensive fashion in the drug war for a long time in Latin America. Yeah, and I recall uh, that many years ago there was that plane that was shot down, I think, over Peru with CIA complicity that involved a minister and his wife and child or something like that. That's uh, correct. That it was uh, one of the truly tragic incidents because we were helping the Peruvian military identify drug planes coming out of Peru. That one was misidentified, was shot down, and uh, you had a couple of very innocent victims as a result. We don't know how many other innocent victims may have been involved over the years. Uh, planes were shot down. Um, how many involved true drug traffickers? How many involved Innocent parties, we, we simply don't know. And I don't expect U.S. authorities to volunteer that information. Uh, that would be somewhat uncharacteristic. But uh, the U.S. military has been uh, a participant at a fairly quiet, uh, fairly low level, but at a, at a rather extensive level for a very, very long time. One of the yeah. things I think we need to worry about is the militarization domestically. Uh, not only have we seen the militarization of America's police forces, which very much had its roots in the war on drugs, the equipping of America's police forces with military hardware, the use of military tactics including the no-knock uh, warrants, the breaking down of doors at 
early morning hours and so on. Uh, all of that had its roots in the war on drugs. So uh, to me, that is a, a trend that is especially worrisome. And uh, I see that as one of the consequences of the war on drugs. It's one of the reasons, one of the important reasons, to get rid of the war on drugs as soon as possible. Because I don't want to see that trend develop any farther than it has. Yeah, and not to mention the, the assaults on search and seizure, privacy, liberty, and it's also unnecessary. I mean, it, if, if you legalize drugs, Latin America would, would restore to a sense of peace and harmony where it'd be fun to go on vacation there, where you wouldn't have these drug gangs and turf wars and massive drug war corruption and the like. Uh, let's wrap up the show by talking a little bit about uh, Duterte, the, the uh, president of the Philippines, because it seems to me, Ted, that he is really the poster child for winning the war on drugs. I mean, he's bringing it to its logical conclusion here, uh, much to the chagrin of even drug warriors. But would you wrap up the show by telling us a little bit about what he's doing and what's happening there? Duterte is uh, someone who has basically married the death squad tactics of uh, autocratic regimes in the 1970s and 1980s with the uh, drug war. He is using death squads to go after accused drug traffickers and drug users in the Philippines. And already... Uh, well over 300 people have been executed in that fashion uh, by police forces, by vigilantes that are friendly to the regime. And all of these people have been killed without even a semblance of due process. And Duterte is not apologizing one iota for that. He defends the tactic. We're getting rid of bad people. Well, imagine if you carry that logic to its conclusion. Uh, there are lots of bad people around in all countries. And evidence is already coming to light that some of the people who have been executed uh, may not even have been drug traffickers, may not even have been drug uh, users. They may have been shock of shocks, of Duterte, that he may have been using this crusade as a cover for getting rid of political opponents. And that's the kind of abuse that we can expect when we allow a crusade against drugs to run amok. It is just the latest country in which this kind of mindless crusade has caused enormous societal damage. Now, the United States, I would hope, would distance itself very quickly from Duterte. But we'll see if that happens. Yeah, I mean, he's really, he's, he's going... the ultimate drug warrior. He really is. That's what I was about to say. He is the ultimate. He, he's going to win the war on drugs, and he's showing... What needs to be done to, to win it? You just the government's got to, got to be given the authority to go out and just kill people with impunity, without any trials or due process. And he still isn't winning it, despite the fact he's already killed all these people. So well, well stated, Ted. Thank you very much. This is Ted Carpenter. Uh, works at the Cato Institute, fantastic libertarian organization. Uh, you can check them out and read their great articles at Cato.org. And Go out and buy a copy of, of uh, Ted's great book, The Fire Next Door, that explains what the drug war has done to Mexico and actually all of Latin America. Thank you so much, Ted, for taking the time to share your perspectives. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.